Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, let's see, class stuff. Thursday, we have an assignment due, right? I saw like 50 people had already uploaded their second assignment. So just a reminder for those of you that are not aware of this, that this is due on Thursday. It's the same as last time you have to upload it. And it's due by, I think, 9.15 uh, at the end of class. So I would suggest you have it uploaded prior to that. Um, let's see. In the news, has anybody been following the news in the last 24 hours? There's been a whole bunch of nutrition stuff on it. It's all about meat. Okay, so every every yeah, it's everywhere. Like I'm, I imagine I went surprise. I haven't seen the paper from the 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 daily today, but it wouldn't surprise me if it has it on there too. Um, I'm just gonna play this little video, kind of summarizing what they were. Processed meat poses the same cancer risk as report from the World Health Organization says eating processed meat poses the same cancer risk as smoking. The report puts processed meat such as bacon and hot dogs at the highest risk rating. That is the same as cigarettes and alcohol. Red meat is called the next highest risk. The North American Meat Institute calls the report quote dramatic and alarmist overreach. Dr. David Akers is one of the world's leading cancer specialists and a CBS News medical contributor. He joins us from Los Angeles. Dr. Akers, good morning. Good morning, Charlie. So tell me what you think about this report. Well, the World Health Organization said not that it was the same risk as cigarettes and smoking, et cetera, but that it was definitive that there was an association with cancer. And I think that's real. Processed foods can slightly increase your risk predominantly of colon cancer. To put that in perspective, the lifetime risk of colon cancer is 5%. If you have a hot dog every day, your risk goes to 6%, an 18% increase. So it's very, very small. Should we stop eating these processed meats? Well, I think we've always known that processed meats too much is bad. And what the data show is that three and a half servings a week of regular meat has no real health detriment at all. Processed meats aren't good for blood pressure, have a slight increase in colon cancer risk, potentially a slight increase in prostate and pancreatic cancer risk. They're very small, but the key is what Grandma used to say, moderation. <laughs> well, let's go there. <laughs> I say that to Charlie, too. <laughs> so, but, but just help us, help us understand what red meat is and processed meat, because that's a critical distinction. Right, so red meat is, you know, you put a steak on the grill. Processed meats where they take meat and they put in, whether it be lots of salt, preservatives, nitrates, and things to make it stay longer or taste differently. So bologna isn't a natural meat. Hot dogs aren't regular red meat, they're processed. And so we need to stay away from the processed. But the key is moderation. You know nobody is going to eat a hot dog every day, which will raise the risk. Once in a while, it's fine. What about the benefits of red meat, though? Because I remember a period where we read studies saying women and, and young teenage girls weren't eating enough red meat. Are there some benefits that we should be aware of? I think that's the key thing, is that, yes, there are benefits to meat. Everything has a risk and a benefit. When I drove to the studio this morning, there was a risk. Something bad could happen. I could get in an accident. But obviously, the benefit was greater. Red meat has significant benefits. It's nutrients for much of the world. Obviously, with the current environmental issues, it's unsustainable, the rate of which we're all eating red meat. But that's a separate issue. But we clearly need to keep doing what we're doing, which is moderation. The Mediterranean diet, by far, is the healthiest diet we all can do. So, the, the good news is we can still have bacon every once in a while. <laughs> yes, this report is a kidding. lot of hype, but it's not a major change in what we're doing. No, we're going to talk about moderation in this break. Too. <laughs> moderate <Okay>. break. <laughs> Before we can what? <laughs> All right, Dr. David. How many of you have seen this in the news? A bunch of you. All right. So does this change your perception on how much processed food you can eat? No? Is this really, I mean, is this earth shattering to anyone? This has kind of been known for a while. It's just finally, the, the big deal with, with why this made the news is the uh, WHO is a World Health Organization who has kind of like a lot of say, I mean, worldwide, obviously. And so when they looked at all the published, or the, all the research on this, they kind of came to this big general conclusion after summarizing everything, saying that this is a big deal. Usually you hear it in the news, like a study came out and it linked 
you know, processed meat and cancer, or another one didn't, or whatever it is, but they kind of summed it all up, and since they're like a big governing body, that's why I got a lot of uh, press time. But does anybody know why, or first of all, I think you have to put in context here and um, uh, the significance of this. So as they talked about, it's, it's a slight, maybe a 20% increase in, in colon cancer. Compared to like smoking and lung cancer, it's not even on the same spectrum, right? I mean, it's, smoking is, is way, way much higher for as, as far as causing cancer, especially lung cancer and other types of cancer. Um, but does anybody know what it, what it is about processed meat that makes it increase your cancer risk? Yeah. So most people in here aren't going to know that, but um, there, there's a, a, a reaction that happens called a Maillard reaction. Is when you when you cook things, usually at a high temperature, some of the components in that food interact and they form um, other chemicals that can be carcinogenic, basically. Okay. Um, we won't go into the depths of this. If you go into other food science and nutrition classes, you'll probably see it. So it's not like you're degrading nutrients or something like that. You're actually forming new compounds which might trigger cancer. Um, the other thing is a lot of these things have a fair amount of, uh, many of them have salt, uh, uh, some other things in them that may not be too great, but it's probably these, these new chemical compounds formed in the processing of the meat that's probably what the bad guys are. So any other questions on this? All right, go have your hot dog for lunch today. Okay, so question of the day. Let's start off with a couple questions a day before we get into the chapter. It says, can you trace the path of one nutrient would take in the body? It would start, the food is broken down and taken in the bloodstream. Where does it go from there? So this is a good question. And this is something that um, I, I thought about doing anyway. So we're going to do a few different nutrients here. Okay, so we're going to start off with carbs. What is the, probably your main source of carbs in your diet? What's, what form is it in? <coughs> Storage carbs. Well, how, how do plants store carbs mostly? Grains. Say rice or pasta. What form is that carbohydrate in? Starch. It's usually a starch or some sort of something like that. So, whoops. Yeah, sugar could be as well. But, so you start with, whoops, I'm having all sorts of problems today. Start starch, it goes in, right? Goes down, gets into the stomach, and most of the digestion happens here. And in here, that starch is going to go to, I just use G for glucose, right? It's going to get chopped up. Remember we talked about small intestine being the major site. Okay, then, once it's in the small intestine, which you can see over here, um, I'm, I'm pointing to it on my screen, which you cannot see. Um, if, you, if you take your intestine out and you look at it like this, you see all these, this web here. These are all blood vessels leaving the small intestine. There's a lot of blood vessels there, so it can drain those nutrients away. And all of them, we talked about, f f uh, drain into uh, what we call the portal vein. And so it's, these are almost like, if you think of rivers and a tributary all flowing into the big Mississippi here, that's what's happening, okay? So they all drain into the portal vein. So this glucose is going to get absorbed in the intestine, and it's going to get up, end up in the portal vein. So now what's going to happen to it? Well, if we eat this as a meal, um, and we have a lot of carbs coming in, um, that means we're also going to release what hormone? Insulin. Insulin. Right? And so insulin is going to have a big influence on what happens to this, this glucose. So a little bit of it, I'm just going to put a little arrow, it's going to go here, but most of it is actually going to go here. Okay? And this will be driven in part by insulin. So insulin tells your body to take up and store that glucose. And the primary site, if you eat a meal, like 80% of the glucose goes to your muscle. Okay? if you eat a normal meal. And it's to store that glycogen for later. Right? So once it's in the muscle cell, the primary fate of that glucose is going to be a pathway we haven't really talked about too much, is it's simply going to go and be stored as glycogen. Okay? Now there are other cells that are going to use the glucose. That, that's the major fate of glucose from your diet. 
Now, there's going to be many other cells, your brain, many other cell types that use that glucose, and it goes through glycolysis, and then the whole citric acid cycle, electron transport chain, to generate energy, okay? So that'll be meeting the cell's needs, but if you look at the absolute amount of where the glucose goes, it's going to go being stored in some, mostly in your muscle, but also there'll be some stored in your liver as well, all right? So if we do fat, fat is primarily stored, or we eat as triglycerides, which we will consume. Question? Yes. Uh, when you store glycogen, mm -hmm. do, do my like, muscles get affected by that in any way? Does it, does it make it like, harder to do exercise? No, no, not hard at all. Actually, the, the, okay. well, we'll talk about this, uh, not this chapter, but the next one. We have an exercise chapter. The glycogen in your muscle is absolutely critical for exercise. And I'll say this again, but have you ever seen, um, usually don't see this at the gym here, but if you see some like professional athlete running a marathon or something, and you say, oh, they hit the wall, or the announcer says they hit the wall, like they just faded, their performance crashed. You know why that is? They, de de they deplete glycogen in their muscle. So that is an absolute critical store for really almost any type of exercise. And when you do that, you are out. You see this like in a marathon runner, they're chugging along and all of a sudden, boom, they just, they're out. And that's why glycogen is important. For most of us, I mean, it's not there for us to be elite athletes, but we need to move around, right? And we need to do things, and so that's why it's there. It's what's fueling our muscles. So uh, the fat's coming in as triglyceride. In the gut, it gets broken down. Remember we talked about it mostly going to, to fatty acids and uh, there's also monoacylglycerol, but don't get too caught up on that. Um, now, does this, where does this get um, absorbed? Does anybody remember? Same way as glucose? So what happens in the small intestine is these fatty acids, so um, these are taken, whoops, these are taken up into, if this is our cell, they're taken up, they're remade into triglyceride, and then they're be made into chylomicrons. Do you guys remember this? Now, how do those chylomicrons get from the gut to the rest of the body? This is a test question. The lymphatic system, that's right. So they don't go through this system here, okay? This is a different pathway. So they go through the lymph, and primarily, if you have a diet with a lot of fat in it, so that's a lot of energy, you have glucose in it and other stuff too, where do you think that fat goes? Where are you going to want to store it? This yellow ball right here, the adipose tissue, okay? When you eat a meal, most of the glucose ends up in muscle, a big chunk of it, and most of the fat will actually end up in adipose tissue where it can be stored. So the triglyceride comes in, it's repackaged, and it's stored in fat, so in three days when you haven't eaten, you have energy to break down, okay? And the protein is pretty much, I won't go through the protein, it's pretty much the same as glucose, except I, I mentioned many of these amino acids escape uh, the liver and end up in muscle, depending on the amino acid. And we'll, we'll talk more about this a uh, little bit when we get to the exercise chapter. But hopefully this puts, um, and a little context, uh, what's some of the things that are going on with these different nutrients. Okay, one more question today before we get started. Uh, going back to when we were talking about, uh, I think this was from the protein chapter. So as a while ago, you mentioned that muscles need glucose and carbs along with protein to grow. Okay, and when I mean grow, I mean build muscle. Do you have an opinion on the best source of glucose for muscle growth? Brown rice, quinoa, etc. So let me back up and talk about if you want to make muscle grow, okay? So if you got this, if you got this tiny little muscle here, okay? This is your muscle. You want to get this thing to some big beefy muscle, all right? I am a beautiful artist, aren't I? Um, God, it's like Charlie Brown drew it. Um, so what do we need to get there? So we talked about protein. You have to have protein. And um, specifically, I said the type of protein that is really good is the branch chain amino acids. Okay, so 
that needs to, that you need to have an adequate source of protein and you won't build muscle. Even if you lift and lift and lift without good protein, it's not going to happen. Okay? What is the other thing? Anybody else remember what I said, which builds muscle? What you need? It's a hormone. What's a hormone that says build things? Yeah. Insulin. Okay. Insulin is absolutely critical. This is also the reason if you're fasting or not eating a lot or trying to lose weight, it's hard to build a lot of muscle because when you're not eating a lot, insulin is generally going to be low. Now, back to this question. What type of carbohydrate would drive insulin? Okay. Would something like brown rice, brown rice or quinoa, which has a lot of fiber in it, or would something like starch, which is going to be broken down into glucose? Which do you think would be better? Yeah. So it's actually the more digestible types of carbohydrates. So that's why if you look at athletes, they often have the pregame meal or, well, I guess that's more for, for endurance, but um, a lot of times they eat um, pasta, rice, things like this, because what they're going to do, along with protein, because what that allows you is when you eat that, it gets broken down to glucose, triggers the insulin, and then as long as you have the protein coming in, boom, you get muscles that look like that. And also, if you look at all the, the uh, energy bars, the weightlifting bars, the powders, all that stuff, not only do they have, most of them have uh, branched chain amino acids, in, but they also have some form of sugar or starch in them, okay? So that these two synergize to help build muscle mass. So that's why these are very healthy, undoubtedly. They're, they're, uh, for example, quinoa is very high in protein. Both these have a lot of fiber, but the carbohydrate in them is rather slowly released and you don't get that insulin response like you would with something that's very starchy, like a potato okay, or bread. And so these two are really what drive it. So you want a digestible, easily digestible carbohydrate source and some protein. Okay, so we're going to talk this chapter. So last time we talked about uh, you know, all of the, the biochemistry type stuff, right? Of how we get energy from food and the pathways. Now we're going to kind of scale that up and talk about this in a big picture, okay? How does that relate to us as a, as a whole organism, as a human being? And so we're going to talk about energy balance, we're going to talk about weight control, and we're also going to tie in some stuff regarding eating disorders. <laughs> So uh, energy balance, as you would imagine, is in and out, okay? It's, um, we, we call this energy equilibrium when you're at a balance, when as far as um, your calories in equals your calories out. And we're going to talk more into detail about what contributes to each of these factors here in a minute. When you are in a positive energy balance, this means you're more on this side, okay? And this can happen due to you simply eating more, or it can mean because you're burning less, or both, okay? It's not necessarily, you don't just there gain weight because you're eating more calories. There's the other half of the equation as well, calories in, calories out. And then, of course, negative energy balance is in a period when you'd actually be losing weight because the calorie intake is um, less than the uh, calories you're expending. So hopefully this is all pretty straightforward for you guys, but it's important to understand this. Okay, so how do we actually measure energy intake? And I, I think I, I, I thought I showed you guys this earlier in the semester, but it, it bears um, going over again. The way we, you get those values, and if you look on the back of your Fruit Loops box for breakfast, right? And it says nine calories for fat and four for carbs and four for protein. How are those derived? And they use this little thing here called a bomb calorimeter, all right? Um, and inside here, you take your Fruit Loops or whatever it is, you get rid of the water, because water has no energy, and you stick it in this chamber. And inside that, you have a chamber inside here, and then you have it enclosed, and you have water, and then air in, in, in this big insulated chamber. And so what you do is there's little wires going in, and you put a spark in there, okay? Well, that spark's going to burn it, just like you would throwing a piece of wood in the fire. It's going to burn it, and all of that energy in this food is going to be given off as heat. So instead of, remember, like our bodies, we capture ATP and produce heat? Here, it's all heat. And so what happened is that heat is going to raise this water certain a few degrees in temperature. And that is actually what a calorie is. That's how you measure a calorie. It's the change in this heat produced from burning some sort of food or some, something you would consume. 
Okay, so that's how the original calories were uh, calculated, and these were done. Um, oh God, like over a hundred years ago, these original calculations. Now the problem we have with today is most of the things that you see on the back of your food labels are, you know, it says carbs, protein, fat, but we don't eat those as an individual. We eat those in a matrix of food. And these values are now starting to be questioned about their accuracy. For example, if you take, uh, there was a study just out a few years ago where they looked at almonds. Almonds have a lot of fiber, a lot of fat, um, and the, the calculated average, if you take an almond and you burn it like this, is something like seven calories per gram, okay, when you mix just almonds. But when they actually did the true calculations, when they fed it to humans, it came out to something like four, okay? Way less than they expected. Why would this be? What is different than this versus the human body? Yeah. So it's available to you. What's available to your body? Here, everything's available. You throw a mash stick on it and it all burns, right? Um, but if we have fiber in that almond, okay, and that fiber is encasing other sugars or encasing protein or other things, are we going to get to it? No. So it's, it's in this complex matrix of the food. And so all the time when we're, we're estimating energy in or calories in, like when you guys did your assignment and it spits out all these numbers about how many calories you're eating, this is not an exact science. This is a rough estimate at best, okay? So, and this causes some of the confusion um, of why under controlled conditions some people gain or lose weight because we don't really have that great of idea of what certain foods, how much energy we're actually getting from them. And then you mix foods together and it gets more complicated and uh, it goes on. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about energy expenditure. When we burn calories, where do they go? And we're going to break this down into uh, primarily three, and, and I'll talk a little bit about a fourth, which we already talked about, different components of where our calories go. Okay? So the first one, which I will refer to as basal metabolic rate, and I think I have more information on this on, yeah, on the next slide. I'm just introducing them to you here. Okay? This is basically what keeps you alive. If you wake up this morning, you're laying in bed, you haven't eaten anything, you haven't moved a muscle, that all of the energy you're expending in that very moment, we would call basal metabolic rate. This is your heart pumping, your neurons firing, each of your individual little cells doing their little thing, um, lungs breathing, all of this type of stuff. There's another one you might see sometimes called resting metabolic rate. Um, this is slightly different, but it, this, it's the same basic concept. It's, um, as basal metabolic rate. So there's BMR. You can see on the pie graph roughly, this is usually for most people, this is where most of your energy expenditure goes, okay? Um, is your BMR here, your resting energy expenditure, your basic metabolic rate. Another component is physical activity, okay? So this is anything above and beyond laying out of bed, laying in bed. So getting out of bed, walking to class, writing right now, okay? Any muscle use that is above and beyond that is called physical activity. It's not just simply, oh, I went to the gym and ran five miles. That's true, that's physical activity, but also uh, the voluntary and involuntary movements you're doing right now. Another one is called thermic effect of food. And again, I'm gonna go into each of these a little bit more detail. But I will say this is the, basically it's the calories you burn in response to eating a meal, okay? So you have to deal with that food, and it requires energy to metabolize your food, to digest it, to absorb it, etc. And that's what that is. And then the last one is one we got kind of sidetracked on, and I already introduced you guys, adaptive thermogenesis. This is that brown fat thing I was talking about. Remember, we, we have white fat, which stores, and then we have that brown fat, which essentially just generates heat. And instead of ATP. And um, we talked about that was the last class period, the class period before. Um, and this being more and more recognized as actually being a contributor to human energy expenditure, especially if you live in Minnesota in winter. Okay, so let's, let's focus on the first one, basic metabolic rate. As I mentioned, this is the primary one for most people, okay? Uh, as far as where their calories go. 
who would be the exception of this? Who would actually have this as a small part of their energy expenditure relative to something else? Yeah, if you're an elite athlete, if you're biking the Tour de France or you're a marathon runner, that energy component is going to be massive and it's going to dwarf all of these other ones. But for, I would guess for most of us, um, this is going to be the big one. Okay? And as I mentioned, this is basically the energy used to maintain life, to pump blood, to for your cell functions, respiration, um, etc. And this, uh, I've also alluded to this in class, it's not equal across cells or tissues. Your brain, for example, when you're born, almost half of your energy that you're burning is in your, from your brain. If you think about babies, right? Everybody have been around with babies. They're like disproportionate, right? They look like little aliens. They have big heads and little bodies, right? So they have big brains to begin with. But our brains, even when we get older, see, you guys are all like on your decline here, with your brain power. Um, they're still, 20% of your energy is coming from your brain at any given moment, even when you're sleeping. Okay? So it's a very, what we would call, metabolically active organ. It's always using energy. It's always doing something. And this isn't just conscious thought. Obviously, your brain does so much. It tells your heart when to beat. It tells you um, all the functions on kind of behind the scenes type of stuff your brain does. The other one, um, and, and again, brain we can't control. I mean, we can't control the brain size. Let me rephrase that. Um, so this is pretty much fixed. We really not much we can do about it. Muscle, okay? Muscle, as you see, as you age up to a certain point, um, muscle is going to be another big contributor to your energy expenditure. Now, as you get out, this goes to about 45, as you go out, this line is going to start to come back up. That's because as you age, you lose muscle mass. Okay. The liver, very metabolic, active organ. So these are percent of like total BMR, RMR. So liver, muscle, and brain, between those three organs, they account for about 60% of the energy expenditure in our bodies. Very active. Um, kidney is considering its size, heart is considering its size, and here's the one I always want to point out is adipose tissue. Okay? If you look at by weight, adipose weighs, on all of us, weighs way more than our brain, way more than our liver, kidney, or heart. But look how much energy it's expending. Almost nothing. Okay? And this is white fat. This is our, most of our fat. So it's just kind of hanging out. It's not doing much. Okay? So, um, when you have more adipose tissue, it does not increase your energy demands whatsoever. Now, of these, which of these can we actually manipulate? Which of these can we influence their size to some degree? Muscle. Muscle is the one on here that um, can influence this. And this will come back because when it comes to predicting how many calories we're burning, knowing muscle mass is one of the, the biggest predictor of it. Okay? And I'll talk about that right now. Factors affecting BMR is lean body mass or muscle mass. Okay? Again, if all of us across the board, our brain, liver, kidney, heart, um, you know, there's going to be some variability in adipose, but most of these, we're pretty much the same. They're not that much different. But where we differ is muscle size or muscle mass. And that's going to influence how much calories we're burning. Another one, and this was brought up uh, earlier in this semester about... Um, when we were talking about babies and, and brown fat, is the surface area. So in order to maintain our body temperature, um, if you think about it, we're producing heat all the time from our metabolism, right? But at the same time, we're losing heat. You know, we're evaporating, water is evaporating from me. Um, heat is losing, just uh, coming out from me, right? Um, so it's a balance. And so the more heat your body loses, the more you have to produce to maintain body temperature. And when we look at little people, um, babies versus uh, adults, babies have more surface area per volume than an adult does. Okay? Or you could say an obese person has less surface area per volume than a normal person. And so the more surface area you have, the higher metabolic rate will be. And this is why, this is a big factor why babies down here um, have a really high metabolic rate, like per pound of baby. Okay? so to speak, um, because they're losing so much heat, they have to generate all that extra heat to stay warm. So sex, you, you know, let me say gender. I don't want to confuse you guys here. Um, that's, that's, a, that's more of an energy, that's more of an exercise thing. Um, this is gender, okay? This is a male-female thing. And this goes back to mostly um, muscle, 
Males typically have more muscle. And that's probably the big driving factor. So the temperature uh, that you're in, our environment, right? This is going to be a big factor as well. So part of BMR is to keep your body temperature normal. Keep you at 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 Fahrenheit. Okay? And so if we're all sitting outside right now, our BMRs are going to be higher because we're not wearing our, most of us aren't wearing our coats right now. And we're going to have to rev up our metabolism to stay warm. Okay? So this is going to be a big one um, contributing to that. And then the other thing uh, that you hear is stage of life. And you always hear this um, from people that are older is my metabolism is slowed down. My metabolism is slowed down. What they're generally referring to is that um, you know, they can put on weight easier with less calories, so to speak. And, and part of that is, is, again, muscle mass goes down is probably the biggest driving factor. So they don't have the same um, energy demands. Okay? So they eat stuff, but they're not burning as much because they don't have as much muscle. So that's probably that. Those are kind of the big ones. There's some other ones. But again, the one I really want to highlight here is lean body mass. And um, most equations that actually predict this, um, uh, it, it's based largely on, on how much muscle you have. Yes? Have you done any studies about whether um, a very dramatic increase in brain activity uh, affects the body mass? So somebody asked me this a few years back, and I actually looked into this, and it's so very subtle. Um, this, if you get a spike in brain activity for whatever reason, or you're doing some sort of, um, you know, uh, you're putting people in front of, you know, an exam or something like that, where you see a lot of activity, the the amount of increase you see here is it's it's tiny, it's tiny, because most of your brain, or a lot of your brain, is always firing. It's just those conscious ones that you think you're up rubbing in, but there's so many neurons that are doing stuff right now that you have no idea about, right? So in the grand scheme of things, it's very, very small. Now there has been talk, I mean, we use, I can't remember what the statistic is, there's so much of our brain we don't use. Um, I don't know if but anybody knows this number, it's a lot. And um, there's been people that have hypothesized that if we actually turned on all of our neurons and used our, most of our brain power, that our energy, uh, we'd have to expend a tremendous amount of energy in order to fire everything. But as far as doing some activity to just stimulate um, thought or something like that, probably not. Okay, so the other two components. So the physical activity. Okay? Um, this one, as you would guess, is the most variable amongst people. Because we have couch potatoes and we have people that are on the track team that probably burn four or 5,000 calories a day. And so this one, I can give you a rough number, but it's, it's really, really variable. Okay? And this, I, I mean, obviously, this is influenced by the type of activity you're doing, the duration, the intensity. And we'll talk more about that uh, to come. But the other thing I want to point out is it's not just conscious exercise like we think about. There's, um, there's a guy at Mayo, actually. He, he studies this topic a lot. It's really kind of interesting. He calls it NEAT. It's called Non-Exercise Activated Thermogenesis. And what he means by that, it's all the motions you do that aren't conscious exercise. So it's like, instead of sitting at your desk, if you stand at your desk, you burn, I don't know, how many more hundred calories a day? Chewing gum. Okay? It's like, oh yeah, I'm going to lose weight chewing gum. Probably not, but if you think about it, it's like 10, 15 calories an hour. Right? Um, if anybody's, I'm sure you've all known someone that you've had to sit next to in class or on an airplane or something where their leg is like constantly going up and down, right? Or they're constantly twitching and fidgeting. They've looked at these people and these people burn a lot more calories throughout the day. Maybe they don't go to the gym more, but just these constant little movements, you know, pacing, fidgeting, whatever it may be, can burn a lot of calories. And it actually tracks with people uh, with obesity. So people that fidget more for example, are less likely to become obese than people that are just can like sit there. I have someone, I won't say their name, but that I work with in my hallway who would literally come in at 8 in the morning, sit in their chair, and not get up for 8 hours. I don't know if they were wearing Depends or what, but I would go nuts. If I make it an hour, I'm like, I gotta move, I gotta move. Um, so, but this is another factor, okay? It's, it's another thing that it's not just the conscious. Um, going to the gym, biking, running, whatever it may be. OK, 
Okay, so uh, the third one is the thermic effect of food. And as I mentioned, this is really the energy you expend when you eat food, when you eat a meal. So it's to uh, digest it, absorb it, transport it, metabolize it. Um, you think about all those enzymes and hormones that are released on food, all that requires energy. Okay? And so all of these are balled up into the thermic effect of food. And so the highest one for here is protein. So 20 per 30 of the energy consumed, and now this is the total, the gross energy um, of protein goes to make urea. This is what this accounts for, okay? So we talked about how, I, I don't know if you guys remember earlier on in the year, um, we were talking about where we're getting energy from food, and I said urea is kind of tricky because you have to get rid of this, uh, or, or protein's tricky because you have to get rid of the urea, and that's what this accounts for. Okay. Now, I want you to keep in mind that four kilocalories you see for protein has already accounted for this. So I, I hate this when magazines and news articles say, oh, eat protein because you get less energy because it has a higher thermic effect of food. Well, that's true, but you've already calculated it, that in into that four kilocalories per gram, and it drives me nuts. Um, so, but, but protein is the one that definitely has um, the higher one here. Um, there's very little energy associated with carbs or fat absorption. I mean, it's a little, but it's not a lot. Um, and think about this. When would this occur? When would you actually have this thermic effect food? Right after a meal, right? So you eat a meal, it goes up, and then it goes away. So when you stop eating, you have no thermic effect food. Now, somebody had asked a question, actually a couple of times this semester, people have asked questions about how many meals should I eat in a day? And that whole premise of that is based on this. So some people had thought that if you eat lots of little meals, it'll increase your thermic effect of food over the day and you'll burn more calories. That's really the basis of that idea. Now, as it turns out, it, it appears not to be the case. And if there is any subtle difference in this, remember, this is maybe 10% of your total energy needs or calories you burn. So if you change 1% of 10% is as what, 0.1%, nothing, right? So it's really that thermic effect idea of multiple meals, etc., is probably just not, um, probably not true. So then we, we talked, already talked about the, uh, the brown fat stuff, so we're not going to spend too much time on that. So just to kind of look at, at where we get calories and where they go. So we talked about fat, carbs, protein, and alcohol. These are the only four known sources of energy in our body, okay? We can't just sit out in the sun and get energy like plants. That would be cool. Um, and then, so that's the intake side. And then the output, again, our basal metabolism, our basal metabolic rate accounts for most of the output. Physical activity can vary greatly. It can be bigger than this one. It can be down here, okay? Um, thermic effect of food is usually pretty small and pretty constant. And um, then there's this thermogenesis one, which we talked about, this brown fat. And this one is, is really quite variable, because some people have this, some people don't. It's induced in some, it's not in others. But I think this is an important concept to understand of where calories are coming from and what is, what, where they're going, basically. And that when either one of these, is, you know, it's on a scale, obviously, and this goes down or this goes up, it affects energy balance in your body. So how do we actually measure energy expenditure? Okay. So there's a couple ways of doing this. Um, one is where they actually take, there's not that many of these, they take people and put them in a chamber. Okay. And this chamber is like super insulated and it's got all these measurements and cool things on it. And what they can actually do, it's sensitive enough, you can measure the person's body heat. Because remember, when you burn energy, you're getting, capturing ATP, but most of what you're burning is you're producing heat. So the more heat you produce, it's the more calories you're burning. Okay? And so we call that direct calorimetry. You're measuring the heat produced from that person. And this is a really, really accurate way of doing it. There's another way, and many of you have probably seen somebody like this, or if maybe you've seen somebody on a bike where they're wearing a mask type of thing with little tubes coming in and out. This is what we call indirect calorimetry. And if you guys remember, um, earlier on we said when, in order to get energy from food, you need your food and oxygen, and one of the outputs is carbon dioxide. So what this does is it measures oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. 
And from that, not only can you tell how much energy you're burning, you can tell what you're burning. Okay? That ratio, which we won't get into talking about it too much, can tell you if you're burning carbs or if you're burning fat, which is a really useful thing, especially uh, when it comes to athletes and performance. And then the last one, um, we can actually use um, isotopes or stable isotopes. These are not the, the radioactive ones that everyone's scared of. Um, and we actually can use this by following water. Okay? Something as simple as water um, we can use. And I won't go into the gory details of how to do this. But it's kind of cool because you can have people come in, drink a glass of water, and then come back at a week or two weeks or a month later, and you measure their water again, and you can tell how much energy they burned over that time. So this is kind of cool for like um, free-range human type of studies, where if you want someone to go out in the wild and live their life and you want to figure out how much energy they're burning, then that's pretty cool. Okay? These are kind of, you have to put them in a chair or in a chamber or something, and you can't really do too much. Okay, so estimating energy expenditure. No one really wants to measure these things if they can avoid it. There's some rough ways the book and other places you'll see have these things called um, uh, estimated energy requirements and uh, physical activity levels. And it's just this really crude estimate of either I'm sitting on my butt all day, I walk a little, I walk more, I walk a lot type of thing. But um, these, are, again, are very inaccurate. Perhaps a... a a better way of when you calculate these into a more of an equation, okay? And if you do this, it actually comes out and it will be pretty accurate. So you have a number, you factor in your age, your physical activity level, and your weight and your height, okay? So I've done this calculation. Let's say you're in this class, you're 18, you're 120 pounds, uh, you're a female, you're 5'8". If you do this, you're burning, on average, um, about 2,451 calories per day. And I gave this person a fairly active level, okay? So, whoops, fairly active level here. So this means someone that's pretty active, um, given these uh, dimensions, so to speak, is burning about that, which is probably pretty close to true, okay? So if you want to get a rough idea, you can factor your stuff in here. Now, some of these equations will... Uh, be a little bit more accurate and they'll factor in lean body weight, but you actually have to measure that in order to put it in. This is something that pretty much anybody can do. So that's why I posted it up here. Okay. Any questions on the energy outside? All right. So now I want to switch and talk about what regulates um, calories coming in. And more specifically, why do we eat? So early in the semester, we talked about food choices. We talked about factors that influence our diet, our, um, you know, what's in our fridge, what we eat on a normal basis. But now I want to do a little interactive thing where we talk about why we actually eat. Okay? Why do we take food and put it in our mouths? What is that trigger that makes you do that? What's that? Hunger? That's a pretty good one. Hunger. That is probably the most evolutionary conserved one of all time, right? You haven't eaten. If you've been on a desert island for a month and someone brings you some food you're not too fond of, you're going to eat it anyway, right? Because you are hungry. And that is a major, major driving factor. Yeah. But, but before I go on, I'm curious on how many of us are ever truly, really hungry, like we were thousands of years ago, right? You ever think about it? The last time you've been just super hungry? Probably doesn't happen as much as it used to. Yeah? It's taste. Oh, okay. So you eat because, how about I say, um, dare I say you enjoy it? You enjoy it? Or I would go on further and say it is rewarding. So what's really interesting is if you eat food, and they've done these studies, they put people like a, in a big MRI or scan, and when they eat food, food you like, let's say, certain parts of your brain light up, okay? Certain parts of your, uh, of a region of your brain lights up. Those are the same reward regions that light up when you do drugs, when you have sex, when you something else good and happens in your life, it's your reward center in your brain. 
food is an input into that. Okay? This is also, partly, this is also a concern because why do people become addicted to things? Why do people become addicted to drugs? Because they like spending a lot of money? Why? Yeah. You don't have the low, but along with that, you get the high, right? You get the reward. And that's exactly, I mean, people do drugs because they want to feel good. They want to have that reward, that sensation. The same hormones you eat, or the same chemicals released in your brain in response to certain foods are the same ones that are released um, when someone's, that, that um, you get when, you know, you're doing drugs or whatever it may be. And the problem is this, when you become addicted to these things, you become addicted to sex, you become addicted to drugs, you become addicted to gambling, to alcohol, right? Can you become addicted to food? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And there were some things, I was going to bring it up and I forgot, um, there were some things just on the news in the last few days talking about this whole concept. So we want to feel happy, right? We want to feel happy and good, and food is part of it. And they looked at foods, actually. Maybe I'll find it for next class period and I'll come back to it. And they actually identified certain foods that trigger it more than others. But this is a whole other debate of uh, the addictive nature of food. And there's some really good people on this campus that study this. But I think most people are in agreement is that, without a doubt, that this is a big factor in what's driving the obesity epidemic right now is some foods are just addictive and people eat them because it makes them feel good. Even though they know the long term, it's very bad, right? You know, if you're a gambling addict, for example, or a drug addict, you don't do it because you're thinking, oh, 20 years down the road, this is going to help me, right? No, you want, the, you want that reward right now. That's the same way food works. Okay, so uh, you're eating it because you want to feel that reward. You're eating it because you're hungry. Why else? Why else would you eat? There's more than that, yeah. Absolutely. So I would say it kind of ties into this a little bit, but mood. Alright, how many of you did crappy on the first exam and then went home and had that pint of Ben and Jerry's? Right? We've all done this. Maybe not my maybe not the first exam, right? But you had a crappy day, you go home, you have something to eat, you have a drink, whatever it may be. Or the opposite spectrum, right? Oh, I just got that scholarship I've been looking forward to, or I've been trying to get. What do you do? You go out and celebrate, right? You have your parents buy you a nice dinner, hopefully. Right? But that's that's a thing that triggers our mood has, is so intimately ingrained in our eating behavior. There is absolutely no doubt about that. For sure. I, I know myself, I am very a moody eater, I would say. Okay? And if you ever have kids, they are for sure moody eaters. But we won't go into that. What else? Yeah. Social. Absolutely. So could you expand on that? Give me an example. Yeah. So you go to, uh, I don't know, I guess it's the fall, so everybody has, all the clubs on campus have their get-togethers, right, and their free pizza or whatever. You might not be hungry, but you go and you eat because all your friends are eating. Or you go out to someone's house and maybe you just ate, but there's food around, everybody else is eating. It's a social thing. You don't want to feel like the oddball out, so you eat, right? Kind of peer pressure, so to speak, I guess. But there's that social aspect of it, for sure. Definitely, is a huge one. And this is not just that setting, but also, I should mention too, in, in many cultures, I mean, food is its the hub of the social network, right? You go to Italy or Greece or some of these places in the Mediterranean or, or Asia, I mean, your meal is hours long and it's, it's, it's part of the interaction, of your daily interaction. So food is very much integrated into that. Okay, what else triggers you to eat? Yes. Absolutely. Routine. How many of you look down at your watch while well, nobody wears a watch anymore? Looks at your smartphone and say, it's noon. I need to eat. Right? Right? You do that. Am I starving? Am I hungry? Maybe not. Is anyone else around me eating? Do I need to feel reward? Maybe not. But it's time. We're creatures of habit. 
Absolutely. Routine is a big one that factors into this. And not only eating meals, but also snacking and various other things, right? It's 3 o'clock, it's time for that candy bar, you know, whatever it may be. So routine is a big one. What else? Yeah. Holidays. <laughs> yes. Holidays. So I'm going to group these with, with social, but you're absolutely right. I mean, you could probably put under here, too, um, you know, religious events. Well, obviously, holidays are for religious events, all sorts of these things, where it's this social aspect. I mean, what is the average person on Thanksgiving eats, like, what, 4,500 calories or something like that? I mean, if we all did that, you could need bigger chairs in this classroom every day. Um, so, uh, yeah, absolutely, social events like that. And that, that's why people gain weight over the holidays, right? It's because they're constantly in that environment. You go from... Aunt Alice's place to Cousin Bob's place to wherever and it's just like food, 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 food. And there's no break, right? And you feel that social obligation to show up. They made this food. You should eat some, right? So, that's definitely. What else? Yeah. Uh, seasonal effects, absolutely. Um, seasonal effects, I would say your food choices. I'm not sure, does it affect you physically wanting to put food in your mouth, though? You know what I mean? It definitely affects your food choices, availability and all of that. But I'm not sure if I put season in as far as, you know, it's fall, I want to eat. I, although, although I, I, you know, I will put that in a little bit. I'm going to put a little star. And usually this is not a driving one, but now that I think about it, there is, for sure, some sort of biological underlying thing where winter is coming, I need to fatten up a little bit, right? I mean, most people put on weight during winter. Now, why is that? Maybe we're more sedentary. Maybe it's too damn cold and we don't want to go outside. But I think there's some sort of biological thing from maybe we evolved from bears or something. I don't know what. Where we say, okay, winter's coming. We need more insulation. We need more reserves. So this, this has been shown in lots of animals that they put on more fat uh, for winter. I think we do a little bit. At least some of us do. What else? Yeah, in the back. Cravings. Cravings, absolutely. So cravings. And so what triggers those cravings? Now that you brought that up. So cravings. So I'm craving that bag of popcorn or whatever. What triggers that? This is a bigger underlying question. So let's focus on this for a minute. Yeah. So, so sometimes cravings can be a nutritional thing. You can, there, definitely there are, um, um, I'll put nutrient needs. These are, these are not ones where you're consciously saying, hmm, my iron feels a bit low today. I think I'm going to go, you know, eat a chunk of metal. No, it doesn't quite work like that. But there are... For sure, in most animals, you see, um, I forget the name of this. God, I should have known this. But, like horses and things like that, where they eat the wood and other animals lick dirt or eat dirt, this type of thing. I, I forget the name of this. There's a term that goes with it, but that's usually a sign of they're trying to get some minerals or something that they don't have. And so, is this a driving factor in what my, most people, what triggers most people to eat? Probably not, but it can influence to some degree. Um, but back to the cravings. What makes you want to eat something? Like, something, some craving, what? Advertising. Here we go. Now we're on it. Okay, you turn on the TV, you're ready to eat dinner, it's at night, you're watching, I don't know, your favorite comedy show or whatever, and voila, there's that whatever they're advertising, that ice cream, that popcorn, whatever, and you're going... And that doesn't look too bad. And you get up and you go make it, right? That's what they wanted you to do. That's why they're paying lots of money, okay? So advertising is huge. Look, I think, I forget how many, I saw this statistic one time, how many times every day we are exposed to different advertisements. It's like thousands. It's everywhere. Papers, uh, radio, phone, everything. They're constantly being bombarded. And a lot of them are for food, okay? So advertising is a huge one. What else? Associations. Associations with other foods? Yeah. So, um, I 
absolutely. So there are uh, certain foods that just go together. You eat one, you eat the other. And that's going to trigger you. Absolutely. What's another one? And this is the one you guys have missed so far. I'm so surprised. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm tr that's for sure you're going to, but I'm trying to figure out what's going to, what's actually the, the trigger that makes you eat. Is it the knowledge of that race coming, or is it the routine, or is it just a hunger? You know what I mean? It kind of interweaves with some of these. So I guess I would consider that more of like a routine. You have a race coming up, you know you need to eat a good meal. Um, yeah, let's go over here. Yeah, so. Um, you know, I'm going to keep that on nutrition needs. So yeah, definitely you eat nutrition. But what are the things that trigger you to eat right now? What what makes you want to put food in your mouth right now? What is that? Lack of energy. So you're bored? Boredom is one, right? I mean, like I'm bored. I'm just going to munch on these Twizzlers for a while. Um, I can, I'll put that. I'm going to uh, maybe that's not exactly what you meant, but. Boredom or energy, right? Yeah. Well, that's deep, man. Um, subconscious hormonal balances, for sure. But I would probably, oh man, that could factor into so many of these things like mood, like hunger. Um, that's probably another, that, for sure you're right, but that's like another level of depth I'm not sure I'm prepared to go into. But, but they influence, they, they definitely do, but it's probably through a hunger mechanism or a mood mechanism. Okay, you guys are all college students. What's that? Yeah, that's hunger. Yeah. Yeah, so sensory stuff. I'm just going to put sensory. Popcorn, perfect example, right? You're not hungry. You're sitting around, and somebody down your dormitory hallway starts a pop bag of popcorn in the microwave. We all hate that person, right? What do you want two minutes later? A bag of popcorn, right? That is the trigger of saying, you know, I want to go. You, you smell? You see food? For sure, seafood. Okay? I don't know if I gave you guys this example yet, but there's, uh, this, remember that bowl of soup example I told you guys with the tube in the bottom? The same guy did a study with M&Ms. Okay? So he took people, put a bowl of M&Ms next to him, or he put a bowl of M&Ms in the same room, but like over so they had to get up and get them, or in the next room. And what do you think happened? The closer they were, the more they ate. Their next room, they could see them, they ate them. They had to get up across the room, they ate less. There was in a different room out of sight, they ate much less. This is all common sense, right? So you have to see it. You have to smell it. Sometimes hear it, I guess. Um, what else? There's one big one that I'm really surprised that you guys are not. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, oh, yeah, I'll put environment on it because it, kind of, it, it f kind of fits with in social and, and other things. But the environment you're in, um, for whatever reason, like when I go home and visit my family, I always eat more. Because maybe it's just because my mom's like, you're too skinny and like shoving food on me or something. I don't know. But in different environments, whether it's previous memories or whatever it is, that can definitely trigger too much eating. Yeah. So stress, I'm going to put with mood. Um, but, but this is uh, um, undoubtedly a huge one. Absolutely. There's no doubt. Any other ones? stressed. Okay, you guys are all college students. What does everybody do to get you to come to their meetings? Free food. How many of you, if someone comes, if you go to the meeting, let's say you're not that hungry, and they say, hey, here's pizza, it's five bucks a slice, or it's free. Are one of those going to influence your fat, or if you eat or not? Yes. Free. Okay? Cost. Free food. I will just put free. Free food. This is also why when we go to a restaurant and we buy something, they bring out a, this gigantic serving size, right? And we're like, oh man, I don't know why I can eat that. But usually people do. Why? I paid for it. It's fine. I'm not going to let it go back. That's like giving away food. You've already, you know, you've already paid for it. It doesn't make any sense. Same thing with free food. 
Somebody offers you free food, even if you don't need it, sometimes if you don't want it, you take it because it's free. Right? You feel it's like some sort of ingrained um, biological mechanism where if it's free, you should you should go for it. Anything I'm missing? I think those are there's a lot. Um, it also, given the diversity of these, hopefully makes you guys realize how complex food intake regulation is. Okay? There's a lot of biology, like incredibly redundant biology in our brain to regulate food intake, and, and scientists try to understand that. The problem is, for, for example, obesity. Um, and we have some really good experts on campus that do this. There are drugs that people can take to lose weight. Okay? These drugs at most... Uh, at best, can cause you to lose five, maybe ten percent of your body weight. Is it okay? And the problem with that um, is because partly because there's so many different inputs going into your brain to regulate this that blocking one, everything else just kind of overcomes it. But the other problem is many of these things, when you shut down the food intake, you're also um, you're affecting this. Food is rewarding. So some of the drugs they use to treat obesity, some of the side effects, and that's why many of them have been pulled off the market, is because the people on those drugs have become depressed or suicidal. Right? If you block that reward, if you block that craving, then, as I told you, this is the same pathways that give you reward from other things. Then your whole life becomes less rewarding. Does that make sense? And depressed. And so this is a, this is a big issue I'm trying to understand how all of these social factors and cultural factors and biological factors integrate to influence food intake and what we can do to alter that. Because you can't just tell people, hey, eat less. That doesn't work. We've tried that. Okay, so... According to the textbook, there's a few things here that we should talk about, about eating behavior, and defining what hunger is, and this is, although we mentioned this is obviously a big driver in what we eat, this is really driven by our biology, okay? This isn't, seeing free pizza does not make you, it's not that hunger response, okay? Um, it, it may affect appetite. Appetite is more the, the psychological drive to eat. So this is driven more by external factors many of which we talked about. Okay. Now, two of the things that we talked about, or we, we do talk about typically in this, this field, are called satiety and satiation. And what these are is referring to really how full or fed you feel. So satiety is feeling fed or fulfilled at one or both of the above, from due to these above, okay? So it prevents you from initiating meals. So if, if you feel satiety, you're not going to start eating. You feel content. You feel full. You don't need more food. Satiated is, is a little bit like this, except it's that process when you're in a meal and you say, okay, that's enough. So I am full now. So this one keeps you from eating. This one makes you stop eating. If that makes sense, right? Now, one of the problems with this one down here, and I, I'm, I'm horrible at this, um, is when you start eating a meal, what are the signals that go back to you to tell you to stop eating? Okay, let's just think about this a minute. When you start a meal, what, take, what makes you stop eating? Any ideas? <laughs> Excellent answer. When the food is gone. Okay. <laughs> Very, very true. Okay, let's assuming there's food left. Um, <laughs> there's food left. What makes you stop eating? You have that never-ending bowl of pasta or whatever. What makes you stop? So you, your stomach? Can you can see it like sticking out? What? So you feel you feel the physical distension, right? Okay. So that's that's one. Now, um, there's many. Does somebody else have a comment? Yeah. So body image, you can, maybe you're thinking about long term what this is going to do, or you can feel, you know, oh, time to loosen the buckle a lot, you know, right? Um, but you're feeling that fullness or thinking about it. And um, what's, what's interesting about this is that if you, I guess I want to ask it this way, how long does it take you? If you took that bowl of pasta, 
you ate as much as you could in five minutes, would you feel that fullness right away? There's a, there's a lag here, right? And it takes time. And uh, I do this, we all probably do this, fast food, right? We eat something, we scarf it down in 10 minutes. And then sometimes a half hour later, you're like, oh, I'm still hungry. Sometimes a half hour later, like, I ate too much, right? We've all experienced this. Our body is not, we can't kick in the satiation factor within a few minutes. It takes half hour, hour for our body to sense, for that food to get down where our gut can sense it. And the way we shut off food intake is not only by the physical full, but there's also hormones and things that are released by our gut in response to food that go back to our brain and say, hey, stop eating, piggy. All right? Basically, that's what's happening. And there's a time frame here. And when you eat food really fast, you don't have that control over what your body truly needs and you're not truly matching it. That's why I think many of these cultures were, were or even here to some degree, where you have a meal and you extend it out over hours, you can really more understand what your body needs and matches it rather than just scarfing things and then realizing that afterwards, oh my God, I have a gut ache, I ate too much. Yeah, right here. Um, isn't there also a factor of a lot of people don't pay attention to their body and they don't have that sort of eating? Oh, so, so the comment was that people aren't. They're distracted, basically. That is a huge one. So and, and people have done lots of studies of this. People watching TV, doing something on the computer, whatever, and they're not actually focused on the food aspect. Um, and that causes you to overeat. There's no doubt about that. Whereas if you're in more of a social setting, and the food is kind of the main point, and you're talking with people, it seems to be you seem to be much more aware of it. But that's a that's a huge point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there are, there, there are actually a number of genetic mutations in people where they become hyperphagic, which we call, which means they eat, 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 eat. There's no turnoff. Okay? This is, I don't know if I, I can try and find a picture. The, the classic one is a, um, there's a hormone produced in our adipose tissue called leptin. Some of you may have heard this. And, um, it was discovered in mice, actually. Somebody was doing research, and they had this one strain of mice that were just massively obese. And with all the tools that came along, they were able to identify the gene. And as it turns out, people have that same mutation. And what happens is normally your adipose tissue is where you, it's where you store your energy, right? Most of our energy. And as you make more adipose, it releases this hormone, which goes to your brain and says, we have plenty of energy. Stop eating. OK? That's the way it should be. We have plenty of energy. We don't need any more. But in these people, they, they don't make that hormone, or they can't respond to it. And so there's no break on the brain. The brain just keeps, tells you to keep eating. And these people become massively, massively obese. And for those people, they've, now that we've identified it, they can treat them with this hormone, and they come back to normal size. But unfortunately, this is not the root cause of the obesity epidemic, because it's pretty rare. It's only, I think, probably a few dozen or a few hundred people that have had this. But there are others like this, for sure. There are definitely genetic components to this. So regarding uh, our internal the biological aspects of this, when I talk about the brain, most of where this is happening is in a little region of the brain called the hypothalamus. It's this tiny little, really tiny little part over here. Okay? And this is really, it's the master regulator of eating. And not only does it control things, but it senses. So it senses these hormones released from your gut or from other tissues. Or uh, nerves coming from your gut or your liver or nutrients in your blood. And it integrates all of those signals and says, eat or don't eat. Okay? So it's, it's kind of the, the master regulator. Now, give an example of one I gave. Uh, I talked about leptin down here. I'll skip to this one. A hormone produced in the adipose tissue that acts to decrease food intake. So the more fat you have, the more leptin is produced, and it says, don't eat. Now, conversely, if you don't have much fat, this goes down, and that's a trigger for you to eat and store up your reserves. Okay? Another one is, a, and it's not so important you know these individual ones, but another one that's really of interest is called ghrelin, and it does the opposite. So it's produced in the stomach, okay? So it gets really, really high um, when you haven't eaten in a while. And it tells you to eat. And then when you eat food, it goes down, and um, then um, uh, you 
stop eating. So it's really, these two are kind of the opposite of each other. But there's, that's what makes it so tricky. There's dozens, if not hundreds, of these things that influence the brain. And it's such a, it's a crazy complicated process of what makes us eat or makes us stop eating. And that's why it's so difficult to, uh, to control. So um, I think we'll, we'll, uh, we'll end there and we'll pick up uh, next time.